something that was really helpful for me is that you have to let yourself write the bad version first. There's all of this pressure when you're a writer to say, this isn't good. And again, the word, the operative word is yet. Get all the shit out. And then you can go back and, <laughs> and make it better and better. Just let yourself be bad at first. Welcome to Script Apart, a podcast about the first draft secrets of great movies. Each episode, we speak to a brilliant screenwriter who's kindly dug out their initial screenplay for what became a beloved movie, discussing what changed, what didn't, and why, from first draft to the big screen. This week's guest is Kelly O'Sullivan, writer of the acclaimed new comedy drama St. Francis. St. Francis tells the story of 34-year-old Bridget, a reluctant nanny whose relationship with the smart, tough six-year-old in her care sends her on a moving journey of self-discovery. Kelly stars in the film as well as having written its fantastic screenplay. Funny, relatable and unflinchingly realistic, it's rightly being championed as one of the year's must-see movies. Here's what Kelly had to say about the film's abandoned plot twist involving a kidnapped younger brother, the sexist mainstream movie tropes that she wanted St. Francis to rebel against, and why imagining the life you might have had is a great exercise for storytellers. This is a spoiler-filled conversation, if you hadn't already guessed, so if you haven't seen this wonderful film yet, you may want to do so before continuing. You're listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Kemal Demack. Kelly, thanks so much for joining us. We're right on the eve of this film coming out in the UK, and I know it just came out in the US uh, in March. What's been the mix of emotions for you this, these last few months, finally seeing this project out in the world? I mean, it's been a mix of just absolute joy and delight and then sort of shock as the <laughs> pandemic started. And yeah. then um, this like wonderful tornado of feeling grateful that we got any kind of theatrical release at all. Mm. And then also sort of just baffled by the timing of it. And then delight again, discovering that people have been seeing it online. So it's overall, it's been 90% positive with about 10% of uh, shock and awe. You kindly sent over your first draft and it was fascinating to read. Um, there's there's no kind of date on there. So can you tell me a little bit about when work actually began on St. Francis? Can you remember the rough time when the idea kind of came to you and how long it was after that initial idea that you started working on the screenplay? Yeah, I started writing in January of 2018 and that draft that I sent you I think is from April. But there was an even longer version of the first draft that I couldn't find anywhere that was 180 <laughs> pages long. And I'm kind wow. of grateful that I couldn't find it anywhere. Um, <laughs> but I started writing pretty much as soon as I had the idea. Um, mm. I've done so many things where I've started to write something and then I've just stopped. And so I didn't, you know, I wasn't intimidated by writing what was going to be a full screenplay because I didn't think I was going to write a full screenplay. Mm. Um, but as soon as I had the idea, I just kind of sat down and started and luckily felt compelled to finish this one. This first draft is quite a lot longer than the uh, than the finished film. So the 180 page version, what was padding that one out? A lot more talking. It was just a lot more <laughs> twists and turns. I mean, I come from a theater background where so yeah. much is reliant on dialogue. And so this was the version that I just really let myself go. And then yeah. we sort of, um, you know, whittled down from there down mm. to 130 pages which was still 20 pages too long and um it's interesting from from what i've read about the film um i mean I, I read an interview where you were talking about the level of autobiography in the movie about how um i believe you said that the uh college that bridget didn't graduate from is the college you did graduate from and uh you mentioned that saint francis is almost like an exercise in imagining how things might have turned out for you is that correct? That's right. I think Bridget is me in an alternate universe. I mean, all of Bridget's feelings are my real feelings. We just made Bridget's circumstances slightly more dire than mine. So, you know, <laughs> she dropped out after one year. I finished. I do have a partner who I really love and Bridget doesn't. Mm. Um, but she is very much rooted in the, f the feelings that I have. And it's funny because that's actually something that's come up in a few of the episodes that we've recorded already. Why do you think it is that, like, for screenwriters, that's a useful and an interesting exercise, imagining these alternative lives that we could have lived? Yeah, I think if you start from a place that's really personal, that's the best thing that you can do. And then you slowly realize if it's purely autobiographical, it's boring. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and so then you start to add in fiction from there. And then the character takes on a life of their own. But I think unless you're starting from a really personal place, 
you're not going to have a lot of authenticity or specificity. And that starting place, I mean, the film does so many things that we don't often see on screen and it says so many things that we don't often see on screen. Did you kind of set out knowing that you wanted to make those statements and do those kind of like fresh things that are quite rare in cinema or American mainstream cinema? Or did you start with character and you just happened upon those things? How did, how did it all pan out? I knew that I wanted to treat abortion realistically and non-traumatically. I feel like Mm. in so much TV and film, it's, you know, wrung every drop of drama you can out of that (laughs) situation. And then I knew that I wanted to treat it, um, since I was going to treat it realistically, there was going to be a lot of blood and a lot of things that aren't normally portrayed on camera. Mm. Um, And so that was a very strong intention of the film was just to be authentic in the portrayal of these things that have been kind of depicted in a monolithic way which is Mm. shrouded in mystery and scary it's very scary to watch abortions in tv and film and i don't think it has to be that way every single time yeah i mean it was quite amazing sort of i after watching the film i realized that i had never really i'd never really seen that on screen before in a realistic way and as you say often when it is in a movie it's this bleak thing wrought with drama and anguish yeah, it's just like really sad, scary music underneath, like yeah. really drab colors. The woman spends so long just like staring into oblivion with maybe like a single tear rolling down her cheek. And it's yeah. just all of these things that when you actually go through it, you think I'm not having that experience. Is something wrong with me? Yeah, um, yeah. And so wanting to show people it doesn't have to be that way that it's been portrayed in the past. And when you actually sit down to think about like, the how commonplace that is as a procedure it's so funny the discrepancy that we never see it on screen and never see it realistically there's some statistic that one out of four women will eventually have an abortion and yet it's this thing that has been so stigmatized that people are scared to talk about it in a realistic way they think if Mm. they're going to show it that they have to they have a moral responsibility to make it seem dire Mm. um but actually it's it's dire for some people and then it's not dire for others there's a whole breadth of experience for the women who undergo this procedure and and so far we've mostly seen the dramatic version it's not just abortion there's uh the entire film seems to be about the multitudes of ways that women can experience motherhood and uh yeah it it seems to be a film that has a lot of fun subverting expectations so at the beginning, we have this setup of 34-year-old 30, Bridget who's struggling to fulfill society's expectations of what adulthood should look like for a 34-year-old woman, and she finds out she's pregnant. And it struck me that in other films, and there was one that kind of came to mind straight away, the rest of the film would be a journey to that, uh, to that woman learning to embrace motherhood and becoming the mother that she's supposed to be. Were you kind of aware, was there a type of American movie you were trying to sort of like quietly rebel against or have a bit of fun sort of overturning yeah because that version where a woman like learns a lesson and decides to be a mother that's not realistic for everybody and certainly not for me i feel like that's a very saccharine very sterilized version of how we go about life and it was important to me that bridget she starts in a place of ambiguity sort of i don't know what i'm doing with my life and that she ends in a similar place there's just been a tiny internal shift Mm. Um, that she's now going forward in the world with more self-confidence and more self-acceptance. But yeah, the idea of like, and at the end, if she, you know, if she has this good experience with this child, then she's going to want to be a mother. Like the entire way through, we were identifying what movie don't we want to make so that at every point we could say, we're not making that version of the film. She's going to say, I don't know if I want kids at the end. Mm. And, And that was a great place to kind of retroactively work from. And even before you introduce the like the story of the abortion, she's this person who, yeah, as we mentioned, like she doesn't quite have her life together in the way that society demands that a 34, 34 year old woman should. And it's funny, like the, the trope of like the man child in kind of comedies is really well established, but it's rare that we're allowed to see a woman who's in a bit of a state of arrested development. I think so. I mean, it's everywhere. You Like you were saying that, you look around, there's so many men in their 40s, movies about men in their 40s who like just don't have it figured out. And it's a relatively new thing that we're seeing. I think we're seeing more of it. I mean, certainly Phoebe Waller-Bridge and Fleabag and yeah. um, I think Amy Schumer. And there are people, and Issa Rae, people who are exploring what it's like to be a woman in that similar place. But I think, yeah, society at large is constantly reminding you, you should have been married five years ago so that you can be having kids now before your eggs dry up for forever. I mean, there's much more of a clock 
that's put on women that men mm -hmm. don't deal with in the same way. So this first draft begins kind of differently. So we step right into, in the first draft, we step right into Jace and Bridget having sex. And we arrive at that really funny moment the next morning where they discover that she had bled during the night. Um, but in this first draft, we, uh, yeah, in, in, in the film, we see this awkward house party interaction where Bridget's talking to or being talked at by this guy who very much is the ideal of what people are supposed to achieve by their mid-30s. I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about why after this first draft you dec decided that that scene needed to go in there. What is it set up? We needed to know Bridget's circumstances. So that scene is a pickup. We had shot mm -hmm. the entire movie and then we did a rough cut and we started showing it to people and they were like, who is this person <laughs> who's having sex with this man? Why is she? Who is she? And people didn't know her age. And that was another thing that was really important to establish right in the beginning. So then we started to brainstorm and I described this feeling I have at every party where, um, <laughs> you know, people are like, what do you do? And it's my nightmare question. And then they kind of like learn how old I am. And the, the like glint in their eye of it's got sort of saying, that's okay. That's okay. It goes to, oh, yeah, that's maybe not okay. <laughs> And so we wanted to write that scene in a way that gets all of those circumstances out and also sets up the tone of the film, which is yeah. going to be hopefully like a comedy. You're going to laugh, but you're also going to think like, oh, that that hits home. I'm hoping so many people watch that and say, oh, yeah, I've had that experience where people suddenly look at me differently once they mm. learn my circumstances. There is a scene later on in the script that's cut out the final movie. Bridget is Googling what to do with my life at age 34. But and, and that scene does kind of set it up. It establishes her age and the sense of maybe internal shame and confusion as to the path she's supposed to be on. But, the, but the introducing that intro scene as we see it in the final film, that does the same job, but it does it way earlier. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You just immediately know what she's going through. You immediately know how she's seen by the world. And then you see her make this choice, which is the only other server at the party, the only other waiter at the party. She's like, that's the person I'm going to go home with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he won't judge. Her. He's he's a, like a beautifully written character. He's he's so much fun and so endearing. And um, the scene that follows, Jason Bridget discover that Bridget Bridget had come on her period during sex in in the night. And there's like a lovely interaction here. Bridget, it's like a crime scene. Jace, you have some on your cheeks. Bridget, ass or face. Jace, both like perfect handprints. Um, and that's not in the film. Yeah, that's there's yeah. like a different version of that in the film. But um, yeah, we kind of improvised around that scene. We shot a version of that um, that was in the shower originally. Oh, really? And then we were then we were like, we just need to see. Yeah, I had imagined it like from Psycho that you see like the blood <laughs> dripping down the drain as it's being washed off of their bodies. Yeah. Um, but then we were like, I think we just want to like get to it faster. And so then it took place in the bedroom and Max Lipschitz, who plays that character, is a yeah. fantastic improviser. So he and I improvised around it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I love that scene. It made me wonder though, like, because their, their interaction in that scene and their kind of dynamic the entire way through the film... Um, are you someone who like listens to conversation in real life and really, ha you know, you try, do you actively try and pick up on the rhythms of conversation to help write more naturalistic dialogue? Cause it really does feel naturalistic. Oh, good. Yeah. A hundred percent. I think like I've always been a very nosy person and it's <laughs> finally paying off in my writing is like so many lines from this movie I have directly stolen from real life. I think the best <laughs> joke in the entire film is, um, do you want to know if it's twins? <laughs> when she's getting the ultrasound and then immediately the person says it's not, it's not. <laughs> and I didn't write that that actually just happened to me and wow. even as it happened I was like this is so ridiculous and so <laughs> funny and I could never have written a better line than that so yeah I think like just paying attention is the biggest tool that I've been able to use in writing so far uh so Bridget has been put forward for this job nannying replacing her friend who's moved to another town having recently become a mother um she meets Annie and Maya, the parents of Francis, and they have another baby on the way. Did you always know that the film would revolve around this trio? I did, yeah. From the very beginning when I started writing it, I knew that it would be a relationship with Bridget and the people in the house mm. that she gets 
hired to be in because that's such an intimate relationship. Yeah. And then when I was thinking about that, um, when I was actually a nanny, I nannied for a hetero couple. But in thinking about what we wanted the film to do, which was normalize things that have been stigmatized, including queer parenting, mm. I and just knowing that it would be a film centering women's voices, I knew that they would be uh, a couple of two women. And so mm. then I knew it was going to be this little, you know, a foursome that we explore the entire way through and that Franny is the heart of the film, but that the complicated relationships, you know, Bridget gets a view into Maya, Maya and Annie's world and they get to know her. Mm. Um, and that those four people would be who we were going to learn about throughout the entire course of the film. And they strangely feel not like supporting characters. They're all fleshed out enough to the point where you feel like either like any of them in a different universe could be the lead of this film and it it could be a story told from their perspective was that kind of um yeah what was how was your how did you approach that and was that something kind of that took a long time to kind of make each of those characters feel as lived in as possible i think i just as i was writing them i i like started to get to know these characters so well and started Mm -hmm. to want to hear more about them and i wrote those roles for those specific actors and so there was a part of me that because I know the depth of those people in real life, I wanted to give them good roles to play. I like wanted mm-hmm. to sweeten the deal so that they would say yes and come on and play these roles. <laughs> um, but also I knew that there, there would be this evolution as Bridget spends more time in this household. She sees more and more of them and she sees the layers that aren't presented every day out on the street. She gets to know these people in a way that their friends don't even know them. Yeah. And so that it would be this gradual progression of you meet these two women in the way that they present and they have it all together in a beautiful house and very progressive open ideals and then you start to see the nuance and the complication of everybody struggling with something and there's there's a few details in the job interview scene where they all meet and sit down for the first time that um yeah changed and evolved into the final film so so here there's there's kind of a throwaway line about bridget maybe being a felon and annie who's a who's a lawyer has kind of done a background check on her um yeah can you tell me a little bit about what you were exploring there and why eventually you decided uh, maybe it doesn't need it Yeah, we decided it wasn't necessary. I thought it would be interesting if there were just a lot of red flags for these women and they were like, this is not who we want to care for our child. But then (laughs) that the felony would be something that was like, you know, Bridget tried to get into a bar using a fake ID. Mm. Something that like is really hard to explain, but that just it's not the worst. Bridget is not the worst, but she's not the best candidate. Mm. And then eventually we were like, we just don't need that. We decided to cut away the fat on, on everything in that scene so that we could get into the film. Yeah. yeah. Cause Bridget's already not the best candidate. Like just based on <laughs> yeah. the interview in the film, she shouldn't get that job. We didn't need to add in that she's a, a possible felon. Yeah. The fantastic moment where uh, they ask her if she's close to her brother and she says, no, he's got a job in a house and he's responsible. So, we're nothing alike that's <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so that does all the work we don't need anything else exactly yeah there's also a moment um that curiously was cut out it's like a lovely line um there's a discussion of like the different ways that uh women experience the physicality of pregnancy so annie carried francis um and she describes how it's like being possessed emotionally like the exorcist physically like alien but maya says well for you this is the best i've ever felt I was wondering, yeah, sort of like you were obviously it's quite evident reading this first script that you you wanted to bring in sort of like the idea that like motherhood isn't a one size fits all kind of thing. Um, Could you tell me a little bit about like, yeah, sort of how that idea evolved? Yeah, as you started to write and as you started to write subsequent drafts. Yeah, just just knowing how different women's bodies are and um, that women's experiences of pregnancy, abortion, postpartum what it's like to have a period that it's so vastly different across the board. Um, And I wanted to establish that really early. And also there was something about letting Maya say, this is the best I've ever felt, knowing Mm. that she's going to head into postpartum depression. Yeah. That I wanted to build in this unpredictability when it comes to what women go through, because so many women, they hate being pregnant, but they love having the child. And then some women, they love being pregnant. And then the experience of, being a parent to an infant is sort of devastating. Mm. Um, And so I wanted to build in all of those nuances. And unfortunately, it was just, it was like too long. Again, it's too long, (laughs) so it didn't make it. But I think it was interesting for those actors to know that. Yeah, For Annie to know that she had been pregnant before and that she had just 
the experience had not been right for her. And for Maya, even in that scene, we can see that joy that she has. And even though it's not verbalized, that she loves, you know, the experience she's having with her body. And and I knew that I was going to be setting them up for that terrible fall. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. interesting. And obviously, it's it's very purposeful, the fact that you've got Bridget starting this new job as she kind of is about to confront the idea of motherhood. Um, she does that at a time... She, she's doing this in a house where there are two other mothers who uh, who each have their own kind of experiences of motherhood. I was wondering kind of like what the you know where did the idea come from of like showing these contrasting experiences of motherhood and like what what were you trying to say and and kind of explore i wanted bridget after she decided not to be a parent she made this very proactive choice saying i'm not going to be a parent right now i wanted her to have to sort of be a parent Mm -hmm. to have to be a surrogate mother in those moments and to witness motherhood to witness somebody you know, going through what in an alternate world she might have been going through herself Mm. eight, nine months from then. And to not have it be, again, the Hollywood saccharine, bright and cheery, everybody's wearing like white linen and um, everybody's like (laughs) laughing while they're holding a perfect baby. I wanted it to get very messy. Mm. And for Bridget, again, to see the nuance of that. Um, in a way that is not, you know, it's, it doesn't convince Bridget either way. It just shows her what motherhood entails, which is a whole cocktail of every kind of emotion. Um, but for her to be like, there was an image I had of Bridget holding a newborn after she had just decided to get an abortion, you know, after she Mm -hmm. just goes through the abortion. Um, and so I thought it was a perfect opportunity to combine the real experience I had had as a nanny holding a newborn and being like, this is terrifying. This is yeah. the sweetest thing I've ever seen, but this is also the most terrifying responsibility. Like when I was a nanny, I wouldn't put the baby down because I thought the moment I put the baby down, something would happen to it. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to explore what it would, yeah, what it would be like to have Bridget be confronted with motherhood basically from nine to five. Yeah. And then in her personal life, just being like, what? <laughs> that terror you described that comes out in some of the the like descriptions so you've got like the the scene where she first meets francis it kind of plays out in the script like a slasher movie so bridget hears a noise as a shadow crosses the frame again a la every horror movie ever (laughs) so yeah that's interesting that you were kind of like stylistically uh sort of starting to play with it as well and some of the fear that she had Yeah, I just think kids are scary. And I love kids, but I think they're so wildly unpredictable. They're so helpless. Mm. Um, And if maybe it's different being a parent, I don't know. But being somebody who comes into a house, it just feels like, do they know I'm just a person? Are they aware (laughs) that I'm just a person who like barely knows what they're doing? Um, And the the kind of terror that comes with that responsibility. So let's talk about Francis. So where did that character come from? Yeah, so was was there a real life inspiration and how did you go about like shaping that smart, funny, complex kid? Yeah, the two girls I nannied for were Ruby and Francis. And so I wish I could say that I was creative, but I was so not creative. <laughs> I just like started using that name Francis because I loved those kids so much. And so Francis is an amalgamation of two real girls. Oh no way. Um, and I just, yeah, I just like was obsessed with those kids and it's bizarre to watch them grow. And I still think about them. I like had pictures on my fridge of them, even after I had not nannied for years and years mm. because it felt like such an impactful relationship, at least for me. I mean, I don't probably, they meet a lot of people. I'm just a flash in the pan for them. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, it was really meaningful for me to craft Francis based on two girls I had actually known. So that like, you know, you realize how innate personalities are. And I wanted to have a kid who was full of personality. And again, not just cute, but like troublesome. Yeah. In the beginning, somebody who is obstinate and um, isn't so sure about this caretaker um, so that we could have a journey to the trust that they find with each other. Because it starts off, uh, Bridget describes Franny as probably having a cemetery of tortured animals in the backyard in this first draft. and yeah, oh, that's journeys, so, I don't even remember that line. That's so funny. Yeah, it's great. But, you know, it, we journey from that point of like complete terror to this incredibly close relationship by the end of the film. Um, 
how would how would you describe the way that their relationship evolves and is that evolution kind of like how did you see that evolution kind of reflecting Bridget's own change in personality and worldview? Yeah, I think it's a slow burn. I think slowly they earn each other's trust and I think they're very alike and very similar. Mm. And um, that's kind of where the friction comes from. But then ultimately that's where the trust comes from. And um, I, the most important thing to me was that they get comfort from each other. Mm. And Bridget's not a perfect nanny, but at a time when Franny is scared a couple of different times, Bridget is able to step up and say something. It's not always the right thing, but she's able yeah. to be there. And then at the end, Franny is able to say like, you're good, you're okay. Um, you, you're, you're not a bad person. Cause I think that's deep down what Bridget is scared of that she has some fundamental flaw or that she's totally screwed up the potential for her life. And Franny gets to say like, you're fine. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. And be totally non-judgmental about it. Mm. And we then get to the, uh, the actual abortion scene and uh, we, I mean, we touched on the the twins gag earlier, but like that's just like the tip of the iceberg. There's so much humor in that entire scene. Um, I love the woman who asks if it's uh, if it's Bridget's first time, and then reading. It, it turns out she's talking about reading Harry Potter. And then there's this, uh, you know, is that the one Dumbledore dies? Dumbledore dies. <laughs> I've gotten into trouble with some people online, and then also in some Q and As, because people are like. I haven't read it. How dare you? And I'm, but it's been what, like 30 years? I mean, it's been a long time at this point. I figure it's okay to spoil yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. But there's also, there's just lots of just fun little touches. I really like the, uh, the doctor saying, I understand you're here for an abortion. And Bridget replies, yes, I'm in the market. Did you set out to make that scene as kind of funny and humorous as possible, bearing in mind what we know about abortion on screen and how it is usually, as we discussed, so bleak and grim? Yeah, absolutely. Again, that like story that I have about, do you want to know if it's twins? Like, I just remember at the time being like, this is not in movies and TV, but this happens to people. These like mm. absurd moments. And so that moment in the waiting room of just, what, to me, what would be even more devastating to Bridget in this moment to find out that Dumbledore dies? Like, oh, great, <laughs> on top of everything else. And I just feel yeah. like that's the way life is, um, that these strange, odd moments happen in you know, moments that feel devastating, but then they make us laugh. And Bridget's way of dealing with the world, I think, is through a sense of humor. Yeah. And so I think when she jokes like, yeah, I'm in the market, it's a joke for herself and for the other person in the room that then also comes with these complicated feelings. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's not on the sitcom level with like a laugh track and everything. It's like, -da -bam. <laughs> it's much more trying to find humor and trying to find um, these absurd moments in, a, in something that could feel so dramatic. And then when they go home, Jace is obviously there. There's like that fun moment where Bridget suggests that she shouldn't have to go through this herself. He should eat some raw chicken to give himself food poisoning. So they're both like undergoing a bodily trauma at the same time. Yeah, I mean, can you tell me about sort of the decision to... I mean, well, yeah, Jace is such a great character. I'd love to know sort of like how you went about sort of molding him and and what you saw him representing in Bridget's life. Well, it was really important to me that Jace be like a lovely, supportive, sweet guy because mm. I feel like in another version of this film, men would just be vilified. And then this film is easily dismissible. Mm. And I don't find that to be realistic. Jace is generous and um, he, he says all the right things and he's there for her. And I think there are so many guys out there who are like that. Mm. And so it was important to me to have a character who is completely supportive of her and, and, and even in some ways more emotionally open than she is. Um, yeah, because again, I didn't want it to be dismissed as, well, she got an abortion because she wasn't with the right guy. Or mm. had, had they fallen in love, had he just been better, she wouldn't have made that choice. Or to make men out there who see the film feel um, villainized, because I don't think that's fair either. That's not the goal of the film. The goal is to say even when somebody is lovely and supportive and saying all the right things, there's still going to be fissures and fractures yeah. along their way, um, especially when it comes to somebody not being ready to talk about their feelings and the other person keeping an emotions journal you know like that's two yeah. very different ways of <laughs> of handling the world um but i love jay so much and and from top to bottom i think he does things almost exactly right in this film 
Yeah. And not yeah. not in a saintly way, just in a way that he's he's trying to be there for her. And the way the way that you approach Jace is kind of consistent with the way you approached almost every character. There's I mean, there's one character who doesn't quite get it. Yeah, there are two who I wasn't very empathetic towards and they yeah. stick out like a sore thumb. But yeah. <laughs> But um, yeah, the I think the phrase I've heard you discuss elsewhere is mass empathy, like coming at your script um, with an attitude of most people are just trying their best and they're like good hearted, you know, some, you know, there's like, you know, there's there's something to be empathized with there if you just dig deep enough into the character. I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about that and sort of like how you came to that philosophy. I think on my good days, that's how I'm trying to see the world is everybody is fighting a battle we don't know about. And um, people are just fascinating and interesting and complex. And I knew that I wanted, like you said before, that hopefully every character in the film, you feel, even if it's just a momentary interaction with them, you feel the depth that makes you go, that's a person. It's not just a character. Mm -hmm. And I think it lends a lot of credibility to the film. If you're not able to dismiss anybody and it's also just like a world view that I deeply believe in mass empathy which does not mean that I'm good at it all the time <laughs> but since we were able to take time in writing the film I was able to be deliberate in yeah. applying that empathy the character who maybe is um yeah sort of most devoid of that empathy is the guitar tutor Isaac um what so what kind of inspired you to kind of bring him into the script and um yeah so what were you trying to sort of um explore in Bridget's personality by have her have this kind of like quick dalliance with this guy who sort of uses her and then sort of discards her and is, is quite like blaming of her. Yeah, I wanted the biggest pivot away from the Jace character as possible. So Jace mm. is saying, let's talk about this. I'm interested in what you feel. I'm, I'm here for you. And Bridget, I think, is intimidated by that openness. And so she does a 180 degree pivot to the guy who's never going to ask her a personal question about mm -hmm. herself ever. He's going to play guitar in her face, um, say ridiculous things. Um, but I also wanted to show that in some ways that's a teenage move. You know, like mm -hmm. I even past my teenage years dated people like that for far too long yeah. because there was something about it that felt you know, it's, it's like a self-sabotaging thing. It's when you say, I know this isn't necessarily going to be good for me, but maybe it'll just feel better in this moment. Yeah. And so it was a way of showing again that Bridget's 34, but she's still making those mistakes. And I think in a way that a lot of people do. Mm. Um, and then I wanted to show a different way of handling period sex, an alternate version of how some guys handle Freak that, which out. is quite honestly to be very insensitive and shaming and total assholes yeah there are other sort of like male characters in this first draft i'm not speaking about chad i love chad what a character i hope you uh yeah i hope there's a real life chad out there the kind of rich kid gaming on the sofa while you're trying to have a romantic dinner i mean you know he's based on like so many guys who i knew in my yeah. 20s that you just go over to their apartments and you're like oh this is a world view that i haven't seen before <laughs> yes but um in the first draft there's gabe and yeah, I was hoping you could tell me about Gabe because Gabe doesn't make it. Um, he is, he's an ex fiance no, an ex fiance Yeah. So um, he, yeah, I mean, tell, tell me about that character. Yeah, Gabe is her ex fiance who has the version of the life that Bridget is expected to have. Mm. He has a very good job. He has a child. Um, he seems very settled, very successful. And I just wanted to, have a moment where Bridget is sort of blindsided by that and have a moment where Bridget can sort of co-opt <laughs> Franny and that, you know, suburban version of life and pretend that it's hers mm -hmm. and um, a chance for Franny to see Bridget really lie. Um, that I wanted to have Franny unwillingly be complicit in that lie for a moment and be like, what is going on? And to have all of those complexities in a beautiful park scene. Mm. Um, because I feel like I've had that moment too, where you run into people from your past and all of a sudden it feels like a competition or like a race to how quickly can you say, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm doing great. Yeah. Um, yeah. And ultimately we didn't put it in there one because it's a long scene, Yeah. but we thought that that was sort of achieved with the Cheryl scene with the friend from Northwestern who's yeah. now a self-help writer 
we thought enough of that was achieved that we just didn't need it. From this first draft, it seems like taking him out gave you more space to explore Maya and her struggle with postpartum depression. Was was that kind of the intention or? I think as I continued to write, I just became more interested in Maya. Mm. Um, and there was a version of the script where like Maya goes in for her post um, partum appointment and she is filling out, they do like postpartum depression tests mm. and she's taking it and she, she realizes it. And I don't think that's in the draft that I sent you, but over the course of, you know, many rewrites, I found out that that was much more interesting territory for me to explore rather than just like another romantic interest in Bridget's life Yeah, yeah. was to say, what is going on here? Sort of in the shadows of this beautiful house with Maya by mm. herself. The only downside of losing Gabe is we do lose an incredible, incredible uh, scene where he's, is it, so Bridget, he asks her if she's married and Bridget says, Bridget invents a dead husband who died death by crossfit <laughs> i think he was yeah he uh what he he experienced some sort of a uh, horrible ailment where he um his muscles dissolved into his blood by working out too hard <laughs> yeah that's a thing that's not you know i heard about that one time when i was like that's the most it's terribly sad i can't believe i'm laughing at it right now but can you imagine death by crossfit and just and and that bridget chooses somebody who would be in such incredible shape that it was literally the death of him. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I learned something new today. Um, and then we get to like the tensest or part one of the tensest period of the film, which is this incredible scene uh, where Maya is breastfeeding in the park and she has this altercation with this woman who doesn't believe that she should be doing that in a quote unquote family area. I mean, it's so brilliantly written. Can you tell me a little bit about like the evolution of that scene and, and what the sort of function of it was in the story? Yeah, it first came to me because I knew that they would be watching the fireworks and I just started imagining like the setting around them and in, in Evanston where I've watched fireworks before and then I started imagining it. It really wasn't intentional. It just came out of thinking about what would happen. And then if Maya were breastfeeding in public, oh, somebody might have a problem with that. And then imagining what would happen if they came over and, uh, and shamed her in this moment where she's just had this incredibly vulnerable revelation to Bridget that she's going through postpartum and how that would affect, you know, Bridget, Francis, Maya. Um, and I knew that I wanted it, again, to be another complicated interaction between only women. Because I think in another version, it's like maybe a guy would have come over and do have done that. And in my experience, there is so much nuance in the way that women shame other women. Mm. And so I wanted to have a moment with that. Yeah, it kind of like goes back to that original kind of theme that we discussed of the multitude of ways that women, you know, sort of define motherhood and sort of uh, their kind of expectations of, of what's okay and the right way to mother, right? Yeah, that some women are like, this is the way you do it. And how dare you expose my child to something that I haven't signed up for, which I can agree with other things, but with breastfeeding. I mean, I can't believe that people ever have an issue with public breastfeeding, but they do. Yep, sadly so. Um, we then uh, sort of have this incredible, incredibly emotional altercation with Annie where Annie suspects they've been, uh, she, Bridget has been having an affair with Maya and it's this wonderful scene that like again kind of in keeping with that idea of, of mass empathy it you'd expect it in a lot of dramas to blow up into this like confrontational like screaming but these characters they all find a way to kind of speak civilly with each other and sort of like understand each other i'd love to know sort of like yeah where you began with that scene and sort of how you went about writing it well i knew that i wanted there to be jealousy from Annie, because I do think there's something about that bond that happens when somebody's in your house. I mean, it's why there are so many movies about female nannies and the dad having mm -hmm. relationships, that, that that's an intimate relationship. And so I knew that I wanted Annie to have missed out on this pivotal moment. You know, she missed out on talking about postpartum with Maya, and then she misses out on the 4th of July, and everybody comes home, they're laughing, they're having a great time, and she's not a part of it. And it's hit this tipping point for her where she she never wanted Bridget in the house anyway. Mm. Bridget was not supposed to be the nanny. 
um, she's lost control. And so she has this breaking point where, you know, she confronts them and I don't even really think she thinks that they're having an affair. It's just that thing that bubbles up in the moment where you're like, yeah. ah, is this the thing that's happening? And then you <laughs> yeah. sort of feel embarrassed because you've had that really embarrassing release, at least for me, that's when it's like crumple. Yeah. Truth yeah. comes out. Tears are here. Here's what's actually going on. And I think all of these women are scared. And Annie is really, really scared that she's losing her family because her family is the thing that she is most proud of in the entire world. Mm -hmm. And so I think by by able by her being able to say that, she opens up this place of safety for Bridget to have this other thing come tumble out. And then they're both sort of left saying, okay, bye. <laughs> like <laughs> it was important to me that they don't then resolve everything. And there, it's just a couple of lines and then everybody goes on about their life because that yeah. feels real to me too. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. We then have uh, a scene that is really different to how it came out in the final film. So, in the final film, Bridget goes to church and she has this kind of like fake confession in the confession booth. Confession booth? Is that the right phrase? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm being a bad, you know, Irish Catholic. In the film, Bridget has this kind of fake confessional moment with Francis and but actually, but in the first draft, it's quite different. And we have this story thread that is completely abandoned. So it's a priest that, uh, it's a priest that Bridget is talking to. And she talks about this younger brother that she had. And I mean, yeah, Kelly, why don't you tell us a little bit about how this, how this panned out, how this was originally in the first draft. I'm trying to even remember this first draft. I know that it's based on a real thing that happened to me, which was, when I was younger, I do have a little brother. I was like watching him and he fell into, oh no, this is a different thing. Was it um, that he's picked up and he's almost kidnapped? kidnapped? Yeah. Oh almost my God, kidnapped. so this, this happened to me. I was at my grandparents' house and my little no brother used to, I don't know how he did this. He was like an escape artist, but he used to figure out how to get out of whatever door was keeping him into places. Mm. And so he escaped my grandparents' house in a diaper and was like walking down the street. And by the time my grandparents and I realized what was going on, I think I was like six or seven at the time, um, we saw him get picked up by these people. I think it was in a truck and put Jeez. into the truck. And my grandfather almost ran, he drove a Cadillac. He almost ran, uh, drove his big Cadillac into the back of this truck to be like, no matter what, this truck is not going anywhere. Yeah. And he didn't, he just honked. And then they let him out and they were like, we're so sorry. We saw this baby like wandering down the road. We just wanted to, you know, save him and, and pick him up and put him into our car. Um, but that, that's based on, I mean, that really happened. But then I, it didn't deserve a place in the film to me because I didn't want people to say, ah, that's why she doesn't want kids. Right, yeah. Because I think the temptation would, would be to say, if she hadn't gone that, through that traumatic experience, she would want kids. That's her problem, quote unquote. That's the yeah. issue. Yeah. When I thought it was much more powerful and again, nuanced to say, nothing is wrong with her. There doesn't mm. have to be anything wrong for somebody to be ambivalent about children. And then the priest, the priest was in there just as like, you know, that's the first way that I wrote it, but I, I figured out that it would be much more in keeping with the theme of the film to have the place that Bridget feels safe be in Franny's company. Yeah. yeah. And that, that is that is the person she needs. She doesn't need a priest. <laughs> and that felt, you know, much more cliche and Ultimately, it was much better, I think, to have Franny be that. Yeah, because this is something that you had sort of teased earlier in the first draft. Um, yeah, Bridget has these kind of nightmares where she's there's, there's a small child and you don't understand what's happening. And then she looks down and she's bleeding from the chest. So it was kind of like fed in to the, to the first draft. And then you have the reveal at the end. But I can totally understand when you put it that way, why sort of you felt like that conventionally... Would it be fair to say that that's conventionally what, you know, uh, dramas often have, this kind of little mystery and then the reveal at the end? And Yeah, and it may have been like a more quote-unquote exciting film, but I think it would have, for me as a viewer, I would have been like, oh man, did you have to like give us a reason for why? Can't the reason just be that she doesn't know? Because mm -hmm. I think that's much more reflective of many women's experiences. Talk us through 
the the final scene where uh francis like has her first day uh, at school and there's this wonderful moment she like runs out and they have this like lovely bonding moment did you always know that was going to be like the emotional pinnacle of the film that was where that that was where you were heading every step of the way yeah, the saying goodbye, the like three month time constraint that they have together. That's why I've always like loved, I love films that exist in a, a pocket of time. Yeah. And that's the way nannying feels is you have this pocket of time with them. And then you're like, wait, this is just a job. Yeah. <laughs> you're not, you're not my friend. We're not going to hang out all the time. And of course, you know, you can and you do, but it's not the same as seeing somebody every day. Yeah. And again, I wanted Bridget to have that experience of, taking a child to school for the Mm. first time and saying goodbye, which is such an emotional experience for so many parents. I wanted Bridget to get to feel that too. The love, the pride, the sorrow, um, wondering what's going to come next. Mm. And then um, the sort of like running to greet each other. We've been playing with this like, it's a non-romantic romantic comedy from my point of view. It's like a buddy comedy and it follows the tropes of, you know, there's a meet cute. There's all of that stuff. And we wanted to play with the idea of like two people running together at the end of a movie um, to say their goodbyes and their versions of I love you, which they never actually say to each other, but it's their version. So um, what did you like the writing experience as a whole? Was it easy, quick, laborious? When you reflect back on it now, what was the process like? It felt incredibly torturous and it still (laughs) does because I think you're confronted with your own mediocrity most of the time. And then you kind of have to have faith that it'll get better if you keep working on it. I will say that it came faster than I was expecting it to Mm -hmm. because I I knew if we started writing it in January, I had a first draft three months later. And then if I could just hurry up and get it done, we could shoot that summer. It was either shoot that summer or wait a year. And if you wait a year in independent film, it's like it may never happen. Yeah. Um, And so it was in some ways really fun and liberating. I feel like I got to put my parents up on screen and write them in a very loving but truthful, funny way. I got to put, you know, voice to so many actors who I love. I got to like sit there and think, oh, I'm writing for my friend Lily. I'm writing for my friend Charine. Um, But then it was, I mean, there were dark nights of the soul where after we were like, we're going to shoot this thing, I would just sit there and think this is not good. (laughs) <laughs> um, and nobody will care about there's there's no plot to this movie it doesn't follow any sort of like traditional structure um, but luckily I was surrounded by an amazing group of collaborators who would say like okay but just keep going yeah there's something here and we can cut away most of the mediocre stuff which thankfully we did cut away a lot of it <laughs> is that your biggest advice to aspiring screenwriters who are trying to write their own St. Francis just keep going and surround yourself by people who are going to tell you where the mediocrity is and help you cut it out. 100%. And then also something that was really helpful for me is that you have to let yourself write the bad version first. Mm. Because I think there's all of this pressure when you're a writer to say, well, it's not, this isn't good. And again, the word, the operative word is yet. Mm. And so if you can just be okay writing all the get all the shit out and then you can go back and <laughs> and make it better and better um yeah just let yourself be bad at first i think That's awesome. and then you'll you'll go back and you'll reread and you'll be like but there's something to this line and i can build a whole scene around this one line after all the success of this film um can you tell us a little bit about what you've been working on since and what, what your next couple of projects might look like yeah it's the laborious task of writing again i'm deep in the <laughs> trenches of it Um, I have a screenplay that I feel like is pretty set. And now that we're trying to get other people to finance with a bigger budget, which I'm learning is much harder to do. We were so scrappy. Mm. We had all this creative freedom. And then as soon as you try to get actual resources, people are like, let me give you some notes. (laughs) Um, And this, this is going to take a long time to do. And and suddenly it feels difficult in an entirely different kind of way. Mm. Um, And then, so I have one screenplay that I'm hoping we can make in, 2021 hopefully we'll be able to make movies again well yeah and fingers then, crossed oh god you know um i should just write movies that are outside involving two people who can <laughs> never get close to each other that there's some <laughs> sort of plot based around that but that then i have another screenplay that i'm in 
the torturous um, stages of writing where I'm like, there's no point to this. Nobody's going to care. So it's interesting to have those feelings be very familiar and to realize they're probably just part of the process. Well, Kelly, this has been absolutely fascinating and I love the film and I can't thank you enough for coming on and uh, telling us all about it. It's been my total pleasure. Thank you so much. And please burn that draft that was sent (laughs) your way. Just make it disappear and never see the light of day. (laughs) Will do. You've been listening to Script Apart. Hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Kamel Demek, with music from Stefan Bindley Taylor. Get in touch. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, or you can email us, the script apart podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Hey.